welcome everybody to the fourth day of this Alive Leadership Summit. And I'm your host, Kirsten Babel Lundberg, and I'm also the founder and the owner of the Leadership Method. And by now you probably learned that uh, to be an alive leader is not only by, about be living and breathing, it's about to be the leader who inspires performance, your own, others, or the organization. And in this Alive Leadership Summit, we've been discussing the five steps you need to be an inspiring and alive leader. And that is authenticity, listening skills, intentional presence, and value awareness, what we were gonna to talk to about today, and it's also energy. And um, values is really something, uh, a really exciting topic, I think. You, you hear a lot about how uh, the most successful leaders and organizations consciously choose to live by core values and promote successful attitudes and behaviors. And today I have with me an expert in this area. It is Richie Jill. And uh, so very, you're welcome. Richie, to be here with us today. My pleasure to be here. And, and uh, Richie, he is, uh, he is um, um, uh, he's the founding partner and also master practitioner at Axialent. And uh, he's also a managing director and chief culture officer. And uh, so here comes the core values. So let me just tell you about Axialent. It's a global leader in business transformation services for organizations looking for profit, move, move, to move beyond profit, actually. So, okay. yeah. And uh, Richie, he's, uh, he's been working more than 20 years in the different global organization and uh, um, have a lot of ex extensive experience in leadership development, organizational effectiveness, and in the corporate world. And during his time in, with Axialent, he worked with senior leaders and their teams, coaching and, and uh, facilitating um, these significantly improving their own and their organization's performance. And he is the real culture project, uh, pro culture expert, really. So I'm so glad to have you here with me today and to talk about core values. And I'm really curious about what is, what is core values for you? Where do they come well, from? Yeah, thank you, Sirsten, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here and sharing this uh, fantastic space uh, with you. So um, I, I, as a definition, um, uh, I, would, I, would ex I would explain it with a metaphor. Um, there are many uh, ways of training leaders new skills and, and, and that's possible and, and we are all for that. I mean, we believe in skill building uh, as a way of mastering and accomplishing uh, things that you couldn't accomplish before. Now, there are certain, there are certain aspects uh, of leadership that uh, in order to learn new skills, you have to kind of shift the way you look at the world because if you don't you are going to uh, build skills on our uh, making the, the technology analogy on an old platform you're going to try to build new, new programs that probably won't run so when, when you talk about core values what I interpret is for it to be like the, the kind of the human platform on which you're going to build the new leadership skills that are required for this uh, VUCA world, so to speak, no? And, uh, and, and what's, what's very interesting is that uh, the VUCA world is a world that's exponential, that's very fast, and, and that's, that's turning uh, at an ever-increasing speed. While you have this, this fast world around you that you have to deal with, the more you have this world, the more important it is. You have a, a set of still center that holds you uh, present and in the moment so you can deal with this world. That's what I call the core values, the still center that allows you 
to show up as a leader, as a caring leader, as a as a leader that can you know build on on the on the team skills that can uh, elicit the best of everybody in the team that can inspire people that can listen to people actually that can do all the, the other the other skills that, that you define in a life mm. so interesting so where do those core values come from <clears throat> Well, that, that's a pretty deep uh, question, and it's it's pretty uh, philosophical. Um, we like to say with our clients that we are we are very flexible in in almost uh, any approach to leadership. We we prefer flexibility over rigidity, over you know um, we prefer curiosity over certainty. We prefer uh, leaders that take unconditional responsibility versus leaders that will blame the world for what's happening to them. Uh, and because that gives you power, and then when you blame the world, you get innocence, but you, you know, you lose your power. And at the same time that we are, you know, we, we are flexible in the manifestation of those, of those behaviors, we're pretty inflexible on, uh, on, on those core values, so to speak. So, for example, as I told you before, we believe that curiosity is better than certainty because certainty uh, shuts down the opportunity, the doors for learning, while curiosity reminds you or, or you, are remind, you remind yourself that there could be things that you're missing because there are so many inputs that you're getting all the time. It's an infinite number of inputs and, and you could be missing stuff, and, and then you could be building your own story that has blind spots. But then if you're curious, you can be open to some other people illuminating those blind spots. And then you can co-create something with the other that didn't exist before. Now, if you are certain getting into a conversation, it's very difficult. For example, one of the core uh, attitudes, like you mentioned before, is listening. So how can you listen intentionally? with empathy, with engagement, if you're certain about the answer. It's very difficult. So, so and I want to be clear that we, we are not very flexible on that. So if people prefer certainty over, over curiosity or being a victim and blaming others rather than being a player and, and, and taking you know, the, the, the ownership of the situation you're, you're suffering for, you know, then we are not a good fit for you because we don't know how to teach that. Mm. So one can say that your values are curiosity, uncertainty, and flexibility. I would say, yeah, curiosity, uncertainty, flexibility. Um, uh, we, um, we, we like to uh, speak about one of our values, uh, being lovingly challenge each other as a way of, um, you know, uh, putting the light of consciousness on whatever is not working at the moment, but doing it from a place of, uh, presuming benevolence and presuming good intent from the other and, and bring this, you know, compassion and, and wisdom into the workplace. Uh, one of my, my favorite uh, teachers who uh, I learned a lot of this material with is, is Fred Kaufman. And Fred likes uh, to say, actually, Jeff Wiener, who's the CEO of LinkedIn, he says that, you know, compassion without wisdom is, is foolishness. But then wisdom without compassion is, uh, is you know, it's, it's too hard. And, 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 and then you, you cannot deliver your message. So it's both. So it's, it's a feminine aspect of leadership, which is compassion and listening and, and opening up to, to new stories. And then there is the masculine aspect of leadership, which is more, the, you know, the wisdom, the focus, the, the go, go for it, the assertiveness. So all that creates what uh, we call a loving challenge as one of our, our core values. Mm, I like that. Loving challenge. Great. So, so now we're, 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 we're talking about personal values and company values. So what would you say is the major difference between mm. the two? Well, I would say that... Uh, of course, companies are made of people, and 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 you need personal values 
like you know these values we are we are speaking about um, being more of a player than a victim, being more of a learner than a knower. We we call that the the, the archetype of, of the of the curious leader. We call it a learner, and then the archetype of the you know of the certain leader of, of the arrogant leader we call it the, the knower or the you know the know it all in other cultures mm -hmm. and, um, and 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 you need those values the, the value of, of being able to listen to listen without judgment you know not not to buy your own stories because that that's that's the biggest that's the biggest um, danger or challenge a leader has to overcome you know the, the more successful we are the more we are rewarded in this, in, at least in the Western world, for having the right answers. And when you start believing your answers, you start believing your own stories. And then when you believe your own stories, you forget that they're stories. And then you believe that you are talking about the world and not about your story of the world. And then when you believe you're talking about the world, then you become certain and then you become a knower. So, <laughs> so that's, that's the biggest challenge. Now, those are individual values. When you work with teams, you need the collective values as uh, overlaying the individual values. So, for example, in the same way as in football, uh, you notice that I am not American because I say, for me, football is real football. No, it's not American football. It's, it's we say the same football team. soccer. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you, you talk about football. <laughs> so, in, in football, you know, to make a play, you need several players. You know, you cannot put a play together with one player. Now, for the players to run a play, you need players that have the individual skills that they know how to kick the ball, how to hit the ball with the head, how to dribble, you know, how to make a pass. Now, you cannot put together a play with one player. So, in, in, in the teams, it's the same. So, for example, the, um, uh, being able to talk about any topic, the ability to have difficult conversations, the ability to not have elephants in the room, the ability to, you know, to bring the dead moose from under the table and put it on top of the table and talk about it. For that, you need several people. You, you cannot do that with just one leader. The ability to collaborate, the ability to, uh, to subordinate your subsystem to the, to the bigger good or to the system because if, if you want to optimize the subsystem what we what we claim and this is what we teach our the teams we work with if you try if everybody tries to optimize his or her subsystem what happens is you sub optimize the system so in order to optimize the system you have to sub optimize the subsystems and for that leaders have to be willing to let go of what's good for their own piece of the system you know, it's kind of a sacrifice for the bigger good. Now, if leaders are not willing to make sacrifices, which, you know, the, the word sacrifice, I think it's a very beautiful word, word because it means to, to make sacred. So if you are not willing to make sacred at, at the service of something bigger than your subsystem, then you will never be a, a top performing team. You, you can be a, a good team. You can even be a very good team. Now, if you want to move from good to great, you have to bring those traits into the team. And those are uh, values that are particular to, to teams and not so much to, to people. Mm. So what you're saying is that you have to, you have your own personal values, but for the good, you may have to sacrifice a part of your own values, personal values to align with the, with the company values. Well, that would be true for for uh, for some kind of values. Uh, yes, I, I I hadn't mentioned it in that sense, but I, I do agree with what you say. Mm -hmm. I was I was more, uh, and we can go back to that because I think that's a very interesting topic. Um, I was I was thinking more in what's good for me in terms of outcome in this system. What mm -hmm. would I like for my area, for my budget, for my people, for my resources? And sometimes, and sometimes, you know, resources are, are by definition limited, and there are always more projects than resources. Mm -hmm. so you have to decide how to allocate resources in the way that's best for the team. And sometimes that will mean that I will get that will get I will get underserved in my request for resources because the resources will go somewhere else 
uh, and it's not my area. At the same time, I'm willing to support that because I believe that's the best for the team. That's what I mean when I'm sub-optimizing my okay. own outcome at, at, you know, at the service of the bigger outcome of the team. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. Now, uh, in terms of values, uh, uh, it, it's, it's very interesting. Now, for example, when, I, when we are discussing values with my clients um, and, um, and, and we, we do an exercise around values and, and every time you know you ask about honesty, for example, I would say everybody raises their hand because everybody thinks honesty is, uh, is a, an important value. It's a value that, that people hold dear to their hearts. Telling that speaking the truth, you know, not not lying, uh, not deceiving other people. Now, uh, and 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 nobody will disagree with that. Now, and then I I I, I offer a, a challenging situation. You you know you are robbed. You're held at a, a gunpoint in, in in the door of your home, and uh, and 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 there are some you know. Uh, uh, criminals that, that show up uh, with you and, and you have your, your two children inside your home. You're, you're, you're at, at the door of your home and they ask you, is anybody home? And, and so the question is, would you tell the truth? Because you say honesty is, is a very important value for you. Mm. And, and then most people say, well, no, I would be happy to lie because protecting my children is a value that supersedes being honest all the time. Mm -hmm. So it's not about values, but more how do you choose between values, you know, when, when they come into conflict. For me, that creates the, you know, the, 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 the rating or the ranking of values and, and what's more important for you. Mm -hmm. And in our philosophy, you know, of course, taking care of each other, uh, the freedom is uh, of the values we hold at the top of our scale because we do believe in, you know, in free will. We do believe in unconditional responsibility. We believe that, you know, you ultimately, at the end of the day, you are master of your own destiny. And that supersedes almost any value. So sometimes company values and personal values are not completely, totally aligned. Mm -hmm. Now, it may happen, and, and you can live with that. You can live with that because you can so optimize. They, they may ask you to do something that maybe you would not do if, if it was your own life and it, it were your choices, it was your money, it was your company. Maybe you would make a different choice. You don't think it's the best choice for the company. At the same time, because you have a contract that you want, there are many things that you value about the company you're working for. You choose to sub-optimize your own choice of, your choice of values and you, you choose to go along with what your boss is suggesting that you do. However, that is not conflicting with some basic, very basic core values. So if he would tell you, go and lie to the client and you cannot do that, well, maybe you're going to quit. Mm. And maybe you're even going to, you know, to, 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 to file a suit against the company because they're deceiving clients. Mm. There are some things you will not do. And there are some things that maybe they're not your first choice and yet you can live with them and then you choose to sub-optimize uh, because you, you love the company and you love what the company stands for. And that's more important than honoring that particular value of yours at that particular moment in time. Mm. I understand. That's good words. I like that. So, I mean, it's not that easy. Value is, it's not an easy subject. It's, I mean, it's like you said, it's, 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 it's prioritizing the values and it's also knowing what are my values. How do you feel about that? Do people, are they really conscious about their own values? Are companies conscious? What is awareness? Well, that, that, that's a very interesting question because, um, you know, we struggle like everybody. Uh, because I, I think the most difficult thing in living a conscious life or, or conducting a conscious business is how do you stay conscious mm -hmm. when, when you are, um, triggered or when you are when you are facing all the demands that of, of the context now of the environment uh, and and that is not an easy answer because I, I would say that's the most subtle and difficult part how do you press the pause button at a certain moment to go from what what you call under the line to above the line mm -hmm. and 
able to notice because the problem is when you don't notice. Mm -hmm. You see, it's like you, you lose something, you lose your pen, and then you can look for your pen. So, so losing the pen is not the problem because you can look for it. Now the problem is when you forget that you lost your pen. Because when you forgot that you lost your pen, you stop looking for it. Mm -hmm. So when you become blind to your blindness, then you don't even question yourself whether what you're doing is aligned with your values. Is this the way I want to show up? Mm. How, how does it feel for me? How, how might I be uh, coming across to the other person? What might be the impact of what I'm saying with the other person? To be able to hit the pause button and ask yourself that question, that's the most, I would say, that, that's the most significant shift in, in a leadership in a leader's awareness, so then he, can, he or she can have choices. Mm. Before that, you have no choice. We, the, the way we, we, we explain it is moving from the stories having you to you having the stories. If you can take that perspective and, and you know, take a step back and realize you have a story, then you can question the story. But before that, the story has you. It's like you are inside the story and the story is like a, an invisible dogma that runs your life. So you find yourself doing things. And sometimes, you know, when people are learning to live by their values and to show up moment by moment as conscious leaders, what happens is, maybe you've, you've had this experience too, Shirsten, that people do stuff and after the fact, they realize it was not what they intended to do. That was not what they would have felt proud of doing because now, now they have a different awareness that they maybe learned with us or they you know, learned by reading a book or doing some practices. Mm -hmm. So what happens is it gets worse before it gets better. So because you are as unskillful as before, but now you know it. So now, you, you know, on top of the unskillfulness, you, you become angry or frustrated with yourself because you're unskillful. So it takes time to build the skill. And that's something that we also bring into the workplace. It takes no time to become aware of the possibilities and to like, I mean, you and I are having a conversation right now and we are agreeing on certain things. And, and this is instantaneous. Now, if, if, if we want to build some of the skills that are based on these principles, that takes time and practice. And, and, and it has a lifetime. And if you're not compassionate with yourself and if you're not, you know, if you don't take yourself lightly, it's very difficult, you know, to walk this path. Because if you beat yourself up, and many of the of the leaders we work with are very have a, a very high perfectionist in them, and that is a very big enemy of learning. If you cannot make a fool of yourself in in a good way, you know, like 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 little children that they are not embarrassed about making mistakes. Well, the same thing applies to adults. If you can you know, make fun of yourself and, and be happy uh, about making mistakes, uh, then, uh, you know, everything works. If, if you cannot, then it's very difficult. So maybe that's the missing link. You're talking about feeling happy, angry, frustrated. It's the feelings. Yes. Yes. So how do you know when you, you're, you're not true to your core values? Well, um, in our philosophy, we speak about, you know, the head, and, and this is the gate, the gate of cognition is the gate through which we communicate with most of our clients, because people, they're very smart people, very intelligent, they're senior leaders, and it's very difficult to find senior leaders that are cognitively, uh, that are not cognitively very smart. So normally we encounter very, very smart people. Now the head is a necessary yet not sufficient condition from our perspective. Mm -hmm. So we speak about the head, the heart, the gut, and the hands. So if, if, you, if you want to know whether uh, you're facing a situation that you know, cognitively is not so clear because th th there is contradictory information coming both ways. Of course, you can find more information, but you will always have incomplete information. Mm -hmm. But then you have to ask yourself, deep in your heart and in your gut, how does this feel with me? How does this land in my center? Does it, does it feel, uh, do I feel like smiling when I think about this alternative? Or does it not land well with me? Well, that doesn't sound very 
scientific, but uh, you know, if you think about how you made many of the most important choices in your life, you paid a lot of attention to your heart and, and to your gut. And, and then you have the hands, which is the ability you know, to execute. Because in our, in our philosophy, creating a network or creating a, an organization of impeccable commitments where people will say what they will do and they do as they say, is an incredible difference in, in building a conscious organization. For me, part of my core values is to honor my commitments. So if I tell you I'm going to be uh, on a, at a certain time uh, uh, for a meeting with you, I honor that time. And if I, if, if I need more time, I let you know ahead of time. So like what's happened today, for example, we had a, a commitment for, for two, but I did not just show up 10 minutes late. I let you know beforehand, so you know what to expect. So, in, in, and what's behind that is not only the coordination of actions, because you, you're a busy woman and, and you have to know how to manage your time and how to allocate your time. That's very important. But even more important than that, beneath that, at a deeper level, is the trust between us. You know, if I do as I say, you start to trust me. And then if I don't do as I say, you, you lose trust in me. And if I do it enough times, probably you won't want to work with me any, any longer. And then even deeper than that is the integrity of the person. We say that when you honor a commitment, this sounds like a, 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 maybe a little esoteric, but it's like an instant karma. When you honor your word, when you do what you say you would do, you become that person. And you don't need anybody to tell you that because you know. You know you made a promise and you honor the promise, even if your boss doesn't congratulate you. You know, or even if your boss doesn't, you know, complain with you because you did not honor a promise. You know, you know that you honored your word or you did not honor your word. So being in integrity with a commitment, with a promise, is the deepest level of creating, of, of coordinating actions. So for us, you know, coordination, trust, and integrity are three aspects of impeccability and commitments. And I would say that, and that has to do with the hands, you know, the ability to execute. Because the only thing that changes the state of a business or the state of your life is when you do something. Because, you know, we can talk ourselves to death about certain issues, but then if we don't do something, and, and you know, very pragmatically, when we talk about that, we say, who is going to do what by when? It, when there's crystal clarity in an organization about that, and then people honor that, we, we tell them, look, just do that, and, and, and your culture is going to change because you're, you're going to feel that impeccability inside of you. Mm -hmm. mm, I like that. Head, heart, gut, and hands. Head, the heart, the guts, and the hands. Then I have to, I'm curious, because it has to do with feelings. Do you, do you speak to your manager, the leaders? Can you speak to them about how it feels to be out of your, or not in your core values, or um, you're deviating well, away? We, we, uh, we like to talk about emotions as something that's core to leadership because um, the, the way we talk about emotions, uh, paradoxically, is a very uh, cognitive approach to emotions. Um, let, me, let me explain. Um, something happens in the world and that triggers a story in you about that. So, for, for example, you are walking in the wild and, and you, listen, you, you hear a roar. So your emotional state before the roar probably was a, a state of relaxation, of just you know, paying attention to the chirping of the birds, the, the leaves of the trees, the breeze in your, in your, in your eyes, in, in, your, in your face, the sunshine. After the roar, you are in a totally different emotional state. So you're probably looking for roots to escape. Is there a tree that I can climb? Is there a place where I can protect me? Is, 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 is there a branch that I can use as a, as a weapon? So you are in the same place, and the only difference is now you heard a roar. Now, and you, you are just a hiker. Now imagine that instead of a hiker, you are a hunter that's looking for a, a prey. Before the roar, 
you might be maybe bored or saying, well, this is not going to be such a good day. And after the war, you're thrilling with excitement because now, now it's happening. So now something, you know, amazing is going to happen for you. So it's not, it's not the situation. It's the story you tell yourself about the situation that triggers the emotion. So when we work with emotions in companies, the first thing we say is the emotion is absolutely consistent with the story the person is telling herself about what's happening. So you, you never challenge the emotion because we, at least, we, we, you know, we try to teach our clients and our consultants, you know, if I were you, if I were telling myself that story, I would be feeling that exact same emotion. Mm -hmm. So, and, and what happens, uh, then in companies normally is that uh, leaders, they shy away from emotions. They, they don't like emotions. You know, well, that, those don't belong in the workplace. And we, and we don't believe that. We, we believe that that is pure, you know, mm -hmm. uh, poor leadership to, to be polite. And uh, so, so we believe that emotions bring up very powerful, informa powerful information that will help the team if you can, you know, be with your emotions. So whenever someone becomes emotional, you just hold the space. You don't try to pull the people out of the emotion. Once the person feels accepted and that it's okay, you know, to, to become emotional, to become uh, sad or to become angry or afraid or whatever it is that happens, uh, then you can start to inquire into the story that, that's behind the emotions. And, ma and many times the, the story is a story that when you start questioning the story, you see, oh, well, now that I think about it, I, I, I may do something about that. And when you realize that there is something you can do about that, that emotional state is like transmuted into positive energy, into, into an energy of excitement of something you can do about it. But we totally welcome the emotions at the, at the workplace because we believe that emotions are a core part of who you are as a leader. And it's impossible not to lead mm -hmm. with your emotions. Mm -hmm. It's impossible. So how can we use the emotions as a, you know, as, as uh, you know, um, Neil Walsh, who wrote the book, uh, Conversations uh, with God, he has a saying that I love. He says, you have to pay attention to, attention to the emotions because emotions are the language of the soul. So wh whenever you, you are emotional, there is a deep truth that's, that's revealing to you in that moment. And many times the tears that you're shedding is a window to inquire into what What's important to you right now? What do you care? What do you care about so much that brings those those tears to your eyes? So, and it's so easy to make the question. What's not easy, as I said before, is the ability to you know to press a pause button and realize that you can ask the question. Because if you don't ask the question, then it's impossible. If you ask it, it's obvious. Mm -hmm. And I can really see how that goes together with values, because there is a, an emotion. The, the, the yeah. Values trigger emotions. Yeah. When, when a value of yours feels at risk or violated or, you know, the, 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 you can lose something valuable for you, that triggers emotions. Mm -hmm. Then there can be emotions of the past that you, you think you lost something valuable or there can be emotions of the future. So, for example, uh, fear is an emotion that's related to the future. This fear has an ar archetypal story. The story of fear is something bad might happen. When you have that story, you become afraid, you become anxious. So what's a strategy to deal with fear? Well, and, and you know, after you have accepted the emotion, the, opened the space for the emotion to, to be there without judgment, then you can analyze, where well, is there something you can do to prepare yourself better for the future? Can you mitigate the damage? And, and, then, and then you engage with the person in, in that conversation about the future. And then the same thing if it's a conversation of the past, like for example, sadness is a it's an emotion that has to do with an, uh, with an event of the past. Something valuable was lost and that triggers sadness. And then, you know, it, it's interesting because uh, anger, uh, the way we define it, no, I'm not, I'm not pretending to, to, you know, to have a definition of anger, but uh, the way we define anger is sadness 
something bad happened in the past, plus a judgment that you have that that should not have happened. When you have the judgment that that should not have happened, so on top of sadness, you build anger. So imagine somebody, somebody very dear to you dies suddenly. Maybe first, at first you become angry. I mean, why did he ha had to go, God, why, why did you create this situation? And, and then you're angry about, you know, the injustice. Uh, but then, you know, where, when anger subsides, what remains is sadness. Mm. So sadness is anger without the judgment. Mm. So that's really interesting. I like to hear that. So um, when you work in culture, changing culture or how, how do you work with how does values come in in that work well um, we have a process to work in culture with with companies and normally we would start uh, with uh, a diagnostic we call it holding up the mirror um, we interview people uh, and uh, we do quantitative um, uh, tools and we do qualitative interviews and we interview people about uh, values, amongst other things. We, we, we interview them about, you know, behaviors, which is the way culture shows up, manifests, but also about the underlying principles behind the behaviors. And that, that, th those are pointers to the values that people hold dear. And, and from those interviews and from the, 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 the quantitative uh, tools we use, we derive some conclusions around what's important and what's expected from people in, in an organization. And, and, and then what we would normally do is, that is a situation that as we say in, in, in our coaching methodology, a, a problem is not a coaching opportunity. What is a coaching opportunity is when the problem that you're facing is not what you want. So if you don't like your problem, we, we have to understand, so what would you like? What would you like to have happen? So normally, we would run two kinds of, of, of quantitative uh, diagnostics with, uh, with our uh, clients. We will run a, a current uh, picture of the organization, and then when we uh, do the first workshop, we work with the leadership team normally, or, or with the board, or with the executive committee, to put together what they call the ideal culture, which is, what would you like to be expected from your people rather than what is expected today. And that creates the gap. That creates the opportunity to, to work. And, and, and we built what we call the from to uh, charts. So uh, for example, you, you want to move from a culture of, of show and tell to a culture of, of mutual learning, for example. And that's a big shift in itself, you know, to move from show and tell to mutual learning. Something very deep has to shift because Remember that show and tell normally is what has made this company successful for a long time. So you have to offer a way of letting go of that, not actually letting go. How can you build on top of that so that then you can become a mutual learning organization rather than a, a, a unilateral control organization? And, and, and then we have methodologies that we use, you know, to bring those, those values alive, to understand what they are. So do you like them? We always ask the question, I mean, do you like it? If you like it, then please, by all means, continue doing the same. You don't have to take my advice if you like what you're doing, if you like what you're getting. Now, if you don't like what you're doing, if you don't like what you're getting, if it doesn't feel right for you, head, heart, guts, and hands, if it doesn't feel right for you, then you might consider something different and you know and then we we have a case where we work together in creating that new culture but it has to come from the clients mm. Mm. and their core values and their core values yeah and their desire mm. to you know to embody or or to or to display a different kind of values because they believe that's going to be good for the business it's going to be good for the people it's going to be good for themselves mm. Thank you. That's really, really interesting. So this is the last question. Since our listeners are leaders or leaders to become, what are the advice you would like to give them with regards to values? I have this belief that uh, 
almost, we, we all want the same. People just want to be happy. They want to live a good life. And uh, if you're a leader and if you're responsible for leading others and for creating states of well-being and, and, and growth and professional growth for others, my, I would not give them advice on values because I trust that if, if they can create the right space, then those values will emerge and they will look for them. It's a little bit counterintuitive. Instead of you, you know, having to go and look for your values, just open the space, you know, sit with yourself. And then what's right for you in the moment is going to find you. The, the toughest thing is to get yourself out of your own way. Because many times we become our biggest enemies because we, we believe that we have to make it happen. And the answer is, it's like, I don't know if you remember uh, the, the movie, the, the Legend of Bagger Bands, where Will, uh, Will Smith is a coach uh, and, 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 and he, he's coaching um, a, a golfer that wants to become professional. And at one point in the movie, he says, look, there are an infinite number of plays you can play here. And, and the, right, the right move, the right play is looking for you. And it will find you if you just get yourself out of the way. Mm. So I would, I would recommend the leaders to engage in some kind of self-awareness practice that they can learn to sit five or ten minutes with themselves just paying attention to the breath or, you know, finding their center and opening, being able to open the, the space. Because as we said many times during this interview, if you're able to hit the pause button, then everything we discussed is possible. If you are unable to, you know, to press the pause button, you are going down the rabbit hole with Alice. And then there's nothing you can do. Mm. You know, there's absolutely nothing you can do because you are unconscious. So for me, the biggest challenge is how can you move from under the line to above the line? And for me, that boils down to being able to do it in the heat of the moment. Can, can you take a breath? Can you take a breath before responding to that conversation or to that email that made you angry? Can you not set, hit the send button? And, and be with yourself and reflect what you want to have happen, what you want to create in this, in this conversation. What's the best outcome? How can you make it good for everybody in the system? How can you help the other person grow? And these are very simple questions and, and very meaningful questions, and yet they're impossible if you cannot stay conscious. Mm -hmm. So my advice to the leaders is learn how to stay conscious. And that, that's the most simple yet elusive piece of leadership for me. Thank you very much, Richie. So really, really powerful and profound words. Really, really good. So Well, I'm, I'm happy I'm contributing to this program. I hope uh, people feel inspired and they start doing things that then, you know, they become theirs and, uh, and they're out there in the world. And then, you, and then we, there's more people spreading the word that it is possible to build a more conscious business and then a more conscious world through business. Mm. Thank you. And thank you, dear listeners, for being with us today. And, uh, and uh, we're not finished yet. Tomorrow we have another day on energy. So I hope to see you then. Bye. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>